Kirk Drake, all the way from the other side of the country, Oregon. How you doing, my friend? Welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm doing great. Great to be here. Yeah, this is uh, this is going to be awesome. We had a, I mean, our pre-recording conversation was incredible. I wish we could just have a whole conversation. I mean, we're going to be talking about credit unions here today. We're going to be talking about AI and technology. And I think the credit union aspect is super interesting because I have some experience there that I want to pick your brain on and learn from. Um, but you know, our pre pre recording conversation may be worthy of having a whole nother podcast on because you are also a, a wine connoisseur and a winemaker and own your own winery, which is like, come on, man, that is incredible. <laughs> like always having drinking wine, table wine and right. nice wine ready to go. That's awesome. No, well, thanks. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm a ADHD, very distracted person, but when I focus on something, it's, it's all in. So. I love that. I love that. Well, this is going to be a fun conversation. There's a lot that we can go down. Um, you know, I, before we get into kind of the meat of the conversation and technology, I think that the alignment of some of the challenges that the credit union industry or segment of our industry has is similar to what wealth managers face is with antiquated technologies and risk aversion and, and sure. how to then adopt new technology. So I want to get into the meat of a lot of that. Um, but before we do, I always am interested to meet the people that are on our podcast. That's why I love these is just having conversations. So I always like to ask, you know, what did the 13 year old Kirk Drake want to be when he grew up? You know, so uh, sadly, I would say I'm actually probably pretty close to what I wanted to be with. Um, I don't think I was as specific as exactly what it, what it was, but I definitely wanted to be. Yeah, uh, uh, by that point, I'd already started two or three companies, mowing lawns, paper routes, I, you know, I was even, um, I joked, I had a paper route for the first six months, decided it was too much work, hired another neighborhood kid to have them do all the delivery. And then I just would do the collections and skim 20% off the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even at that age, I had already figured out leverage and, and whatnot. Um, and so uh, really probably around 12 or 13 was the point where I felt like I couldn't rely. My dad was an entrepreneur. He wouldn't get paid for a year and then get paid a ton. And then it kind of cycled back and forth. And it, it stressed out my mom. She always just wanted him to have, um, you know, a nine to five job. And that just wasn't it. He worked every Saturday. And so, you know, it was just, uh, I, I realized the only person I could count on was myself at the time. Um, I've definitely done my share of therapy on trust issues and whatnot in that. But uh, very early, that was having my own source of capital and cash was a key part of that. And so I would start businesses, do that. And then by the time I hit high school, um, I got called one afternoon on a Saturday from a, a teacher named Mrs. Vitos who said, hey, do you want to go start the high school bank? Um, and I was like, no, I'm not really interested in that. I want to date a, like a girlfriend. And my dad overheard the conversation and he's not much of an author authoritarian figure, but he's like, you need to call her back and tell her to do that. We'll talk about it later. Uh, and that was really where I got into banking and, you know, spent the next, I mean, it's been 30 years and I've just, you know, just kind of continued down that string of, of figuring out, you know, I figured out pretty early uh, after college when I was working at Credit that I wasn't. I wasn't like your normal credit union employee in that I I broke things. I wasn't scared. I I didn't care at all. You know, my kind of feeling was, look, worst, I'm 23, 24 years old. Worst thing you could do is fire me. Who the hell cares? I'm I'm going to go get this thing fixed and go improve this, and we'll figure out the details later. And that served me very very well. Other than um, you, you're, at some point you need to play within the system and with the other people on the team. And that got I think it was my sixth or seventh year at that credit union where. We got to a budget cycle and and you could see this collective revolt happening from the all the other managers of we just can't get any budget kirk gets it all right and <laughs> and, and then going to starting a company and and uh looking back and seeing um just looking back as your own leader when it's your own thing and realizing yeah this person you know was an a player they got a ton of stuff done, but they really didn't make for a healthy team dynamic, right? Um, and so trying to, you know, spend another 10 years trying to figure out how to how to fit back into that. So long story short, it was always, I was going to start businesses and do, you know, fun things and and kind of go down that road. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you, you went down that journey of being in the credit union. And so then you went out and started to, you started your own business with CU2.0. And yep. I, I'm I'm curious on credit unions, and and the reason is is because you know with one of our businesses we had 
uh, an app that we were trying to sell into the business and um, into and into banks, credit sure. unions and and uh, smaller deposit banks here in, in the southeast. And uh, it was tough. I mean, this is an industry. I thought that wealth managers were resistant to change. Go go try to sell to banks, yeah. and uh, and you will see resistance to change. Along with antiquated software that is so core to the business that they can't just like go and overhaul that. Right. And and so. What what have you seen been the key to cracking the code to getting credit unions to change? What is yeah. the key? So I think there's there's a, a couple of dynamics that we've seen or patterns over and over and uh, over and over again. So that the first one that is sadly the most reliable is a new leader, new CEO, um, who's younger and in their first three to five years in that role, they will absolutely make changes to. Um, ensure the safety soundness of the institution long term, because what they're trying to do is set themselves up for the next 10 or 15 years. Right. Um, and so usually in that first three to five years and in the last three to five years of their career, they will make material changes to the business. Everything in between, they're just not going to screw it up. Right. They're, 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 their only goal is to just not screw up whatever that is. Um, so that, that's the first one from a, identifying a persona type. The second one is you know, of course, if there's the, the reality, I think, is people tend to think banks and credit unions make the decisions on the basis of what's good for the consumer, what's good for their income statement and those kind of things. The reality is because they're heavily regulated and regulation generally comes out in the form of balance sheet sides of issues. So um, you look at liquidity over the last couple of years as interest rates go up that all the regulators care about is, do you have liquidity, right? Which is, they're not concerned about income. They're not concerned about growth. They're only concerned that you're gonna be able to meet your obligations from a loan perspective and that you haven't over-invested in 30-year mortgages or lower interest rate things in that respect. You look at what took down Silicon Valley Bank, a very small arbitrage around you know yield and it was enough to cause a huge problem, right? And so, if you're the regulator and you're pushing liquidity and and for the financial institution, what happened was you were going along, making lots of loans, things were good. The interest rate environment shifted very, very quickly. And you went from chasing loans to being illiquid kind of overnight, right? And now the regulators are, are all over you about liquidity. What are you gonna focus on for the next year or two? Liquidity, it's gonna be deposits, it's gonna be everything in that direction. And so, You've built this mousetrap that's really good at generating loans, but you basically abandon it in place, you know, <laughs> and immediately start facing the other side of the balance sheet. And in three to five years, when it shifts back, it'll be the exact opposite. It'll, it'll shift entirely. And so I think the reality is the number one decision that is driving the short term decision making these organizations is whatever that regulatory pressure is coming from, which is usually caused by the Federal Reserve changing some market dynamic that had nothing to do with the banks or the credit unions in the first place, right? Uh, they, they change something and then they're, 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 the downstream effect is the financial institution and in that, that shifts that monetary policy. That is, uh, that's such keen insight on, you know, from how to approach a bank, right? And yeah. if you're trying to sell a product that's generating loans and they're focused on liquidity, like it doesn't matter. It Even doesn't though matter you, got the, you got the best trap, it's not going to work. You, you could walk in with an 18% yielding zero risk loan last year and not a single credit unit or bank are going to take it. But if you walk in with a deposit product or a deposit generating product, any bad deposit product is getting traction right now, right? Because people yeah. are willing to try anything to improve the liquidity situation, right? Um, so it, it's so that's the first, I think, um, rule that we kind of follow is it, it needs to impact the balance sheet or it needs to be in tune with what's happening balance sheet wise. The second one is um, there's, there's four of these. So balance sheet, income statement, member impact or customer impact and employee impact. In credit unions in particular, employee impact tends to take number two, the number two spot, um, meaning because they don't own a piece of the credit union, the, the way that they improve their lot in life is reducing the workload, right, or more responsibility or power or something in that. So if you're coming to them with a um, deposit product that requires a ton of labor from their team, that's really stressful for them. If you come to them with a deposit product that is automated and doesn't generate a lot of workload for their team and is easy, that's easy for them to adopt in that situation. Um, the third one is the income statement. So if it's 
improving liquidity, easy for employees, and it, and it's profitable. Now we're in the home run category, especially if it's good for the consumer, right? Like if it also improves the consumer's life, now you've hit the all four boxes and you're going to skip the line on everything kind of going on in that. And so a lot of times though, what you see is these fintechs that solve one of those four, right? And it's not, a, it's not the most important one. So then it's not that they're not going to do it. They're just not going to do it today. Right. And it's in their long term stable of the 83,000 things that they want to do to improve the business. And whenever they get to it, they get to it. Yeah, it's so interesting because as you, as you talk through this, I think back to my experience when I was selling this product, it was like a financial wellness product. And it yeah. was more for the, the wealth management services within the bank. And, you know, at that time, it, it really I mean, that's like more of a retention. That's not necessarily an asset aggregation. I mean, maybe you right. can promote it, but it, it's really on that retention side within that division of the bank, where at that point they were looking at asset growth, like how right. help me grow my assets. And, and, and the banks will just drag you on. Like you're like, this is such a great product. And they're like, this is such a great product, but then it just doesn't hit that side. I love that idea of the balance sheet. And I love the idea of where they stand within their, 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 uh, how long they've been at the firm? Three years, or they're about to be yeah. gone in three years, right? From that standpoint. Now, the, you, we're talking about how does it look from the firm. I think that the other challenge that that fintechs have, and then I want to drive into kind of the future of credit unions as well, is the antiquated technology. Yeah. I mean, the whole the whole banking system is built on like one of three softwares, and they're yeah. not the most a lot like robust new system. Two and, years to get an integration into Fiserv, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to go to Fiserv. I forget the other one, uh, one of the other ones, but. Yeah. Uh, like and to get in there, it takes forever. How how do you navigate that? And it's not like they can switch. Like even if you create a new, I remember one company was trying to create a whole new banking system. Like oh, the bank's yeah. never going to switch. Like that is their whole business is relying on that. So you like how do you navigate that area on the now on the technology side? Yes, yeah, so there's two parts. One of which is you want to have the smallest possible ask that you can have them try something on you know, 45 to 180 day test of some sort. And the second piece is zero integration, right? So um, what we really try to focus on, especially if there's, there's a lot of tricks you can do to make it seem like it's integrated or at least have it be standalone. So non-integrated general ledger where you're able to control the universe, you have your own, you know, um, correspondent or sponsor bank that allows the money to flow and work but behind the scenes is reconciling to a general ledger on the credit union's core. You, you can do it, I've seen loan syndications work that way. I've seen um, loan generation work that way. I've seen uh, deposit generating products where you can give the consumer something fast, easy, non-integrated um, that allows the, the bank or credit union to, I think almost, you almost have to reverse it. Put yourself in their shoes, which is there are 10,000, 15,000 FinTechs at this point knocking on their doors every day and how do they choose and how are they going to figure out which ones are going to be the home runs and which ones are the base hits right and they only have so much opportunity to make bets on these because they can't do all of them right and so if you can give them a way to test and validate that their customer base and their member base wants this thing and is willing to do some work then then that non-integrated quick app or quick website to prove it is the way to validate that. And once they have enough, you know, traction on that thing, it's much easier to then go back and integrate at a later date where it's already working. They've already got an ROI. They've already got consumer demand. It's much easier to pave that path two years from now um, than it is to do that on day one. Right. It's like the small experimental mindset, right? You're yeah. just, uh, you're doing small, quick tests to prove your point and, and you got to figure out how to build that environment without having to do all the work necessary from that standpoint. I think, you know, as you think about it, as you think about the perspective of both how to sell into a, a credit union and then also how to navigate antiquated technology. Now let's kind of fast forward into the wealth management space, right? Sure. I mean, that kind of sounds like the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, It's hard to sell into it because of, you know, the, the hard to see the ROI, they're focused on growth and not necessarily efficiency. And a lot of tools are efficiency growth, efficiency tools. And then you've got antiquated systems that don't necessarily all integrate together. Right. And, and so as you think about the industry, now let's switch the tables and say, now you're the wealth management owner and you're looking out at all these options. How do you, how do you think the best credit unions look and view at this that we can learn from the wealth management side about how we approach innovation, sure. technology, transformation, whatever it may be? 
Yeah, I, I think the 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 ones that are so there's we like to think about is there's multiple layers of innovation. So your your first layer is your tend to you're tending to be looking at um, a cost savings perspective, like this is going to save me some money. The second layer you tend to be looking at cost savings plus um, new feature, new benefit, kind of growth. The third layer is you start doing some incubation, some innovation work where you're willing to try a lot of things and kind of measure them against each other. And the fourth layer is where you're doing tech scouting, right? Where you're really going, what things are on the horizon, blockchain, um, AI, et cetera. How might these impact my world? What's my SWOT analysis look like? So I can start looking for things that fill holes in my um, SWOT that, that come off the shelf or that that use some of this technology in some way, shape, or form and kind of start skating towards the puck, right? Um, m most credit unions, I would say 95, 98% of credit unions are stuck at cost savings, right? That's the only way they can look at innovation. And the reality is a 20% savings in cost on a piece of business in your, in, or a line of business in your portfolio is not going to change the needle long-term. You're not going to gain market share. You're not going to have a competitive advantage. You're just simply going to keep up with the, everybody else who's doing these cost savings kinds of things. You start to improve a little bit when you start saying, well, it has to meet cost savings and, you know, so I have to get some efficiency and I have to get a differentiating feature of some sort. And then you start to make big progress. So there's probably half dozen credit unions that have tech innovation labs where they're getting, they're trying 10, 20 different things every six months and picking the best of those and kind of making bigger bets on those in that in that regard. That's really the best in class. You've got digital credit union, MSU credit union um, uh, th that are doing things like that. None of them in my experience have ever gotten to the tech scouting phase where they start building rails and components and infrastructure in advance of where the marketplace. The only bank that I've ever seen actually be good at that would be like Capital, Capital One, where they saw the end of credit, credit cards and they looked at all the data that they had and said, wow, if we plugged in a bank into this methodology, um, this would be great. They got all the pieces lined up. The 2008 financial crisis happened. They bought you know, Chevy Chase Bank for pennies on the dollar and boom, launched one of the largest, most successful you know, corporate banks kind of uh, in that by, by combining all those things to the ground. And they always described it as, imagine you had a thousand BBs bouncing at a sink. Your job is to figure out where the drain is going to be. Right. And, and and when you start thinking that differently, you start looking at technology and going, OK, um, it's it's likely to me that 10 years from now, AI, if you do not have AI as some key part of what you're doing, these solutions aren't going to work. Right. And so um, you can start using that tech scouting to say, OK, well, I'm going to need to have an AI governance policy. I'm going to need to have you know, an AI first strategy. I'm going to need to figure out how these are going to impact the different areas of my company. And when I'm looking at fintechs that are coming in. I'm going to put extra weight on the things that are already a market leader in AI or were built with AI first, right? As opposed to they had some thesis and then they said, well, it'd be really sexy if I put some AI lipstick on this thing, right? You, you can start to see those trends very, very quickly once you look at it that way. And then that begins to shift that dynamic and you're not, you know, getting yourself stuck. I love that mentality of AI first because I, you know, I, I see it with a lot of technologies now. You know that they they're trying to like evolve their current their old architecture for the current open architecture for integrations for APIs, and it just right. is not. It's terrible. It's too long. It takes too long. They're constantly playing catch up, and it just right. doesn't work. And and they're trying to like overhaul their architecture. Like they're basically trying to redo the plane while it's flying, and it just doesn't work that way. And I think that AI is going to be the same way. And then they say they have integration, but they really don't have the depth of integration that's necessary. Then it makes it useless, but they buy right. it. Consumers buy it. They get frustrated and go in this loop of being where you don't trust technology because you got sold a bill of goods and you didn't see the value of it. And so that's a, you're a, right. a perfect example where if you think of, okay, our standard is we want things that have APIs. Okay. That was yesterday's problem, right? And tomorrow's problem is, well, ChatGPT is going to be able to build a universal API ingester, digester, transfer the information between this. I don't know if it's six months or if it's six years, but I think we could all bet that within ten years, the whole API translation layer conversation is a is a is a stupid conversation. It won't matter at all. Um, and so, once you see that and go, well, if ChatGPT can translate English to Spanish, translating between my online banking platform and my credit card platform is not going to be this huge thing as long as it has a rules kit that it can digest from. 
and once you see that, you suddenly you start stop making your RFP have this requirement of an API because you can very easily see at some point in time in the, in the future, that is not going to be an issue. And instead, I need to make sure I have my AI governance set up so that my information doesn't go all over the place and that I, I can begin to work within that world. And so I, I think so often we were solving the problem exactly in front of our face instead of where it's going to be a couple of years from now. And I, and I think that's a, that's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah, I I um I want to I have a question on that from AI and I want to get to because we're going to transition here to AI in a second but before we do um because like the integration side is something that that's near and dear to me um but when you talk about the four tiers which I love the four tiers I think that the biggest challenge is assigning and aligning assigning an ROI and aligning a leadership team and an executive team to that ROI when you start moving up the tiers because it becomes more and more difficult. Sure. And, and the cost savings is like, okay, let me look at the p &L. Good job. Right. You did it. Congratulations. Check. Let's move on. So what are the, how can you help to understand ROI at these different levels? And sometimes the ROI is not seen for three, five, seven, ten 10 years into the future. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how do you continue to motivate people when you start, oh, you just mentioned we're solving problems in the near term, right? Uh, and, but I'm trying to sell you on something that I'm solving for the long term, but you can't even see what's, you know, what's right beyond what's in front of you. Yeah. I, th I think the best example I've ever seen from a corporate governance policy, and I don't remember what credit union I saw this at, but what they did was they had an agreement with the board policy that basically said, X percent of profits went into this long-term R&D fund, right? And this, and, and it was, it wasn't huge. It was like 3% or 5% and it was non-discretionary. This money was a sustained long-term investment in the future of, uh, future relevancy of the credit union and gets you out of that innovator's dilemma uh, of kind of short-term versus long-term, you know, kind of perspective. And that was that credit union did some amazing things with a very small pool of money, but because it was non-negotiable, the CEO could spend it on whatever that was in that category of things. They didn't have to go back and have a special line item to try to convince them that blockchain was the next thing or AI was the next thing. This was just part of their long-term piece, and it worked really, really well for them to just be able to kind of continuously fund that long-term innovation. Um, that being said, I, it is a very hard problem for like what, what we see in the industry is those visionaries that will create these tech labs that will make those investments, put, you know, $50 million into a fintech fund, those kind of things. In general, in my experience, none of them last in that visionary role for more than maybe five to seven years because they start um, they start tasting all the ice cream, right? So they start licking all 32 flavors. They get overwhelmed and they can't digest it fast enough kind of going forward. And so what happens five to seven years is they just hit their own wake and they aren't because because the the true tech scout, the true innovator looks at it and says, okay, I have this set of problems. Here's these things that are opportunities. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on the things that align in that direction, not the things that are outside of this wheelhouse. I mean, you think about like an investment thesis. They're really disciplined. If it doesn't fit that investment thesis, no matter how good the idea is, they're saying no. Right. Um, and that's where I think the industry gets itself in trouble is they start getting overly um, over. They think they're, they think they're smarter than they are and making all these bets. And the reality is you just can't digest it long term. You have to have a very disciplined, controlled, consistent innovation mindset, which is which requires discipline of, of recognizing, OK, if it's AI first and it's a fintech and it and it isn't solving an existing problem that I already knew I had then the answer is just no, right? Like, and that's okay. I'm going to miss some things in that, but I'm betting on the on the bigger trend in that situation. And that's the more important piece. And from that perspective, and I, I ask this a little selfishly because we're, we're in the process of building an innovation, you know, ecosystem in our own firm today. Is, is that the, the licking 32 flavors mentality, right? Is it because, um, is that come from, they are, they have all, they, they don't have an ability one, you mentioned they don't have an ability to assess what's worth exploring and what's not. That's one one thing. Yeah. But is it is it also that they don't have an ability to cut off when the like when it's like like a like a, a true saying like, hey, we're gonna do a small test and if it doesn't work, it's out. 
And, yeah. and so they just keep these tests running. They have like 40 tests running and they just, they can never let, because of sunk cost fallacy or, uh, exactly. or you know, whatever it may be. Is that also the issue? So it's not a, it's an assessment and also just an ability to cut weight and move on. Yeah. They really struggle to cut off a channel or something that they tried. If it gets, you know, if it gets five members, sure. But if it gets 500, now they're screwed, right? Like they're going to keep that 500. I mean, I can't tell you how many, Credit unions or banks that I've seen, if you go behind the scenes, I, they all have, let's say they have 50 different deposit products, only five are marketed to member or to, to active customers. Um, and behind the scenes, there's 45 that have 500 or or 2% of their members using it, but it's just, they, they can't, they won't go back and kill those off or merge them into other things because they know it's going to drive, it's going to make their call center go crazy. It's going to piss off some customer right in that situation versus your lean startup, FinTech, they're going to try something. If it isn't a home run, they're going to shoot it in the head and move on to the thing that they think is going to be a home run every single time, right? Because they have limited capital, right? That's the other piece of it, right? Yeah, that, that that's one of the lessons I learned when I when, when I uh, looked back at our failed uh, technology company we started was yeah you know, we had we had we had basically we felt we had unlimited capital because our larger firm was funding us um, and. And then once they said, "Hey, you've got to, we got to solve this within this number of period of months," that was like our most focused, best months. But it was too sure. late. It was too late. So when you have all the funding, you just start going everywhere. You're and, like, and really, that's where the, the if they had been disciplined and said, "Hey, you have this much money to solve this problem in this much time," right? And that was the first foray into that. Man, you would have been laser focused. You would have gotten eighty percent of the way there, right? But but they would have spent. 10% of the money to get you to 80%. And then it's an easy bet at that point. Hey, they got to 80% in this amount of time. That's an easy decision to bet another 10% on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That, that The pressure creates focus. And that's why pressure is such a great thing to put on these types of ideas. Absolutely. Uh, from that standpoint. I, I want to shift gears here uh, for a little bit um, into AI. And you know, I, I, there's been, there's like two sides of this coin here, right? People, some people are like, ah, I'm so tired of the, hearing about AI. And the other side's like, hey, I'm going to keep talking about it. I think that that's what makes it beautiful. Um, but I want to ask this one question, um, you know, because we're talking about like, you can only see what's right in front of you. You can't see beyond the horizon. There's also this mentality in human nature that we just like to talk about change because sure. like it, it makes it exciting and and we like to sell people that the, the future is going to be so different than the, than the past. And then in reality, like I think about like Morgan Housel's book, it's like always the same as ever. It's just like the same thing. And, right. and so like, are we falling into that trap with AI? Uh, and if not, why? And if so, how? The reality is probably yes. Yes and no, right? Like, and I think the way I, I've kind of approached it is, so I saw my first uh, material AI talk in 2012, 2013, uh, as a guy who writes a blog called Wait, Wait, But Why? Uh, it was a phenomenal conversation about it. So I walked out of that and was like, okay, now I'm tuned in to this is a trend that's going on. It's probably too early for banks and credit unions, right? Um, and so I just kind of kept an eye on it. And then in 2019, I wrote my second book called Financial, which is all about AI for banks and credit unions. And I published it in 2021 or so, right before COVID. Um, and it was too early. I was still two or three two years too early, but I talked about ChatGPT in it and I kept researching and kind of thinking about it, but I wasn't, it wasn't like I was, you know, it was maybe 5% of my, my R&D time was kind of thinking about that and keeping an eye on it. But what the book did was when I researched the book, I found, I interviewed a hundred FinTechs and 99 were using AI, you know, machine learning, early stages of it. But I immediately thought, well, I bet you if I went into 100 credit unions, there's no chance that 99 are using machine learning or AI in any way, shape, or form. So this is clearly a trend that's that's afoot, you know, that, that's going to come out. So then once ChatGPT came out, AI immediately went and looked at the book and said, hopefully I covered ChatGPT in the book, which luckily I had a short little blurb that, that talked about it. <laughs> some, some snarky comment from Elon Musk from four <laughs> or five years earlier. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, at least I successfully got that right. And then I said, okay, we're, well, we're now at the point where this is real, right? And people can tangibly feel it. So um, I said, well, what would Kirk do today if he could relive 1996 all over again, right? With the internet, the dot-com stuff coming out of high school, kind of looking at that. And I said, you know, the only advice I would have given myself differently is over-invest in learning it now, 
right? Because um, the reality is by the time we see it in the mainstream, we're probably already three or five or 10 years into it, right? Um, and, and unless you're in that industry, you don't even know that it's going on. And so you're really in a early adopter kind of catch up kind of phase. And so I said, well, if I were to give myself that advice, I would go spend eight hours, you know, two, three Saturdays in a row and then commit to two to four hours a week of learning of, of this and see what, see what I could do with it. And then I would pick common problems that I'm running into, right, and see what I could solve. And some of them are solvable with AI and some of them aren't. And so I, that's exactly what I did. I sat down with my kids. We played around with it. We rewrote some of their essays with it. You know, we kind of learned the limitations of it. Um, I sat down with a friend of mine. This was like an epic fail where we tried to use ChatGPT to figure out how to target speaking engagements um, off of LinkedIn profiles. Turns out it just made up hundreds of LinkedIn profiles. They're all garbage, right? Like, but we didn't figure that out until two hours into the call. We were like really crushing it. Think we had this great script. Um, and then I started to see some really big productive things where I've, I've got a, like the winery is a perfect example where we had a wine marketing firm, paid a lot of money to them every month, didn't sell much wine. So I got annoyed and I said, well, how could I recreate what the marketing firm does using AI? And so the first thing I did was I took, um, all the imagery from the website and I uploaded it into Bard and had Bard describe the tone, look, feel of the imagery. And then I put that into chat GPT and said, write me a mid journey, you know, kind of bot or a prompt to create similar imagery. It took four or five hours, but I got it so it can do a hand drawn bottle sketch in different Valentine's Day or Halloween's and different kind of things that is like 95% of what the artist was doing, but good enough. Um, and I can do it on demand in 15 minutes. And then I trained it on my wife as the winemaker, uh, her writing style versus my writing style and had it create prompts to write like either one of us based on writing samples. And, and then I had it generate 20 wine tasting stories where I gave it kind of the background of some great experience we had. And it generates the imagery, the, the story, the rest of it. And in 15 minutes a week, it could produce all the content and copy that I needed to do. And I started posting those in September, October of last year, and it sold 20 cases of wine versus the 18 months I'd invested with the marketing firm selling almost none, right? And I just went, this is the brilliance of this, right? Like if you invest the time, I, as an individual you know, person, I can, I can totally adjust that. And so um, I think I'm long-winded here, but I think that the piece that I kind of see in there is, A, how can I use it for myself? Because if nothing else, then I, at least I'm getting the productivity gain. I'm doing more with it. I'm able to make my life better. Then we, from there, we went into getting my team together and saying, okay, we're going to have a weekly call. I'm not going to put pressure on you guys. I'm not going to put pressure on you to change. What I am going to do is say, every week, you guys need to come up with something that takes you 15 minutes or more that you do weekly. And we're just going to brainstorm of how we might be able to solve that on AI. And turns out some of those have stuck. Right. And we got the efficiency gain and the bottlenecks go away in those parts of the business. And some of them fail miserably, but I, I didn't put pressure on the, the entry level folks or the mid level management to to feel like they had to accomplish something. It was just more of let's be curious about what we can do with this um, and, and figure out how to do that. And so I think as you start to see those and you start to see those percolate up, then it's really easy to see in other startups where they've got the culture and the mindset, the things that are going to get them there, because the reality is if you're not cannibalizing yourself, someone else will. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, to your, to your point, I think that just having the curiosity, I, I believe my opinion and belief from, from experience is that people just aren't, aren't, aren't um, testing out the tools to learn. They're, exactly. they're making this perception of what it is from afar without getting any hands-on curiosity and I just think that that's the wrong way. I think that that's the. I think that that's yeah. a, that does a disservice to what the opportunity is. Now, is it going to be? You know, is it going to change everything? No. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and but I don't think that it's. I don't think we're going to feel it. It's not going to be like this moment in time. Like, all right, today is AI day or Y two K. It's not like Y two K, right? Where no, everything's going to blow it's up. A slow. You know, like you'll hit some point where it'll just take off, but it will be the collective small innovations that make it feel like it does. A hundred percent. And it's just like the Internet. Right. And I think right. that there's some there's some people that that say, well, the, the future is always the same as ever. I agree with that in some sense. But they think about like 
the way we we move around the country is different than it was. That's yeah. evolved, right? Cars has moved from horses to gasoline cars to electric cars. Like that's right. different. Um, the way that we consume information has moved from traditional newspapers to you know online newsletters to you know to app right. push notifications, right? And, and so the internet just kind of naturally evolved, and I think that that's what AI is. It's just going to kind of naturally become who we are. Nobody thought that it was going to be safe to drive across. I remember when Elon Musk talked about it in like 2011, like right. I'm going to have my car drive me from New York to LA, and everybody's like, right. "You are an idiot," and now. People are doing that, totally. and it's like, totally. it, it, but it's just more normal now because it's not that crazy. And I think that that's where AI is. And so, I'm curious from your standpoint, from a credit union standpoint, from a wealth manager standpoint, from a service oriented standpoint, you know, you're mentioning some of the ways that you're using AI from like a marketing side, and I, I've seen that be the most applicable, right? Uh, it's, yeah. it's now applicable. It's a, it's a cross segment that's most applicable. But what is the future? Like, what do you see if you had to vision it out? What what does AI look like? Is it always going to stay in this mark realm, or or what else do you see as the potential I, of it? No, I think there's layers. So I think right now we're in the specific departmental use cases. Have it write a job description, get smarter at prompts, have it do some marketing for it for me. We've got a use case where you upload all your policies and procedures um, from the credit union, and then it, and then ChatGPT can answer questions. You know, show me how to do a stop payment it spits that answer out to the call center representative. So you don't need to spend time treating them, right? It just does that. And then if they rank the answer low, it routes it back to someone else who then can modify the data that was ingested to tell it how to do something to get better answers. And it can do, you know, real-time call sentiment analysis and some of those things. So I think it opens up um, a whole bunch of kind of curiosity things there. But I think that's the that's the entry point, right? I, I think where it starts getting really interesting is when you start going, oh, so the example that I haven't seen come out yet, but would love to, I build it myself if I didn't have a bajillion other things going on is, uh, so my mom broke her shoulder uh, maybe two years ago and I got involved in helping them figure out their finances while she was in some you know short-term care kind of facility. And it dawned on me that, you know, you think about banking is why is there not autonomous banking? Right. Like this idea that I'm moving money between all these different things in a non-optimized, painful kind of way, when these are all just numerical algorithms that optimize this. And I should be able to have a banking app that says, hey, I'm, I subscribe to Fire. So optimize all of my credit cards, bank accounts, savings accounts to increase the chance that I'm going to be able to retire early. Right. Or I just had three kids in two years. And I don't really care about retirement. I just got to figure out how to pay for food, diapers, you know, clothing for these three kids. So optimize cash flow, right? Or I need to, you know, I really, I've got myself in too much debt. I need to pay down my debt. Why am I doing the math on my 12 credit cards to figure out which one has the highest interest rate, which one has the lowest minimum payment terms? These are just simple financial calculations that if something could look at all of those, make that and then say, Here's the, you know, you pay, we're going to come back to you every week and say, pay this, and it's going to optimize that pay down. It's insane to me that, that we're all trying to figure out how to do this manually instead of some autonomous banking app that just does whatever, whatever bidding I want and optimizes the set of relationships within that to make it happen. You know, as you're talking about that, one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, how do I, I, I I'm not like, I, I I, I'm very lucky, but I mean, you know, it running a business, like we run a business and like, I don't know, my family finances and then my business finances and I got taxes here and like taxes there. And like, I, all this, I just all of a sudden get like emails from my account, like you owe this much money. I'm like, well, that's phenomenal. Like, that's great. I guess I hope, thankfully I like saved, but I didn't know, like, I would have loved to have known about that six months ago, sure. uh, would have been great. But they're like, well, we don't know exactly what, like now to my point, I'm like, I just want to create this this GPT that has all my my spending and yep. all my income and I upload it every you know month and it just and it says, Hey, this is where we're predicting, this is what's been historical, and yeah. this is where you're off. Like I, I because I'm thinking like, how do I get my own personal CFO to help me with this stuff? Like this exactly. is my I, I don't want to do it. Well, I mean that's a perfect example. Like if you then layered in tax implications, short and long term, and you and you implicate and you put in um not just retirement savings, but like do you want to pass things on to your kids? Do you not? What are your philosophies on things? This thing could build a highly unique personalized plan and then do the work of making all the changes because half the battle is, I mean, I'm sure from a financial planning perspective, you know, half of your clients, you tell them what to do and they don't do it, 
right? Yeah. It's not that they don't want to do it. It's just a total, I mean, I just, I had this bookkeeper a couple of years ago who said, uh, she said, hey, you know, you need to switch these three bank accounts because it'll make the bookkeeping a lot easier. And I said, yeah, I'm not going to work on that this month. And she's like, well, but I can't keep you as a client. And I was like, oh, okay. She's like, well, why aren't you upset about this? I said, look, I got an hour a month that I'm willing to allocate to switching banks. And the other 99% of my time is going to building a business. I said, I understand that this makes your life harder, but I don't care, right? Like if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. I will eventually change a bank account, but it's not its not something I'm going to go tackle tomorrow and drop everything else I'm doing, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so I think that's the, we're all making those calculations of, is it, is the, sh the short-term pain that's going to cause to switch banks, to change products, to do all that? I mean, I don't know about you. I don't want to call another call center to do a damn thing. Right? Oh, I mean, well, yeah, there's a whole issue with that, right? <laughs> and I, you know, I, I um, and, and I think about it and like, and everybody's like, well, that's just like, I mean, I'm a financial planner. I do this for other people, right. but like, I don't want to do it for myself. Because it's like I, I'm, I just don't. There's time, and right. this is I'm building a business, and and so I want it to be done. But then everybody's like, well, well, then what's your value? Well, my value is how do I communicate that and build the relationship? Right. That is that is my value. Now, but the question that I get to with all of this, right? As I was thinking about it, as you were talking, I'm like, okay, I would do that. But now it's like security. Like, am I just right. exposing all of my stuff to the world for them to see how I spend and where I right. spend and all this type of stuff? And um, and I know that that's what credit unions are thinking. I know that that's what wealth managers are thinking. So what do we need to understand from a security standpoint about AI? And is there ability like within GPT or chat GPT or whatever, uh, whichever outlet you want to go yeah. to do this securely where your information is not stored with everybody? And, and how do we overcome that? I think that that's the yeah. biggest hurdle, especially in a regulated environment like we are. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's two schools of thought, one of which is enterprise GP, chat GPT, you have a lot more controls, not perfect, but you have a lot more controls. I still wouldn't recommend putting a bunch of PII out there. The flip side of that is not that hard to remove all your PII and just have it be an anonymous set of financial data that still tells you, you know, what to do right, without it being personal. Yeah. Um, the other side of it, I think, is, you know, just I, I can't imagine it's that difficult to go to ChatGPT and say, I need to build a custom model that's unique to me that I'm going to, it's an open source model that I'm going to download and use just on my computer and doesn't hit the... World Wide Web of chaos, right? And and I can control it that way. And so I think I think there's going to be layers of how you get to that, but it's just not a. I mean, most of this, a lot of the stuff is getting open source, and it's just not going to be hard for people to kind of extract and and you know, just like we probably sit here today and go, you remember how how many firms got created to create websites and the insanity of that, you know, 20 years ago. We're you, you and I are both sitting there going, man, the idea of downloading and creating my own open source. Chat GPT thing that works for me sounds insane. It probably isn't going to be that hard, right? Well, like, you can actually ask Chat GPT how to do it, and it's going to exactly. give you step by step. And there's like out open source, like Hugging Face or whatever right. it may be, that you can download the whole same Chat GPT to ninety five percent. It's like that's good enough. Like if I could just have that on my computer and that's my CFO, like doing yeah. my budget for me and everything. Like I heard a great um, analysis of this. It was basically like uh, if you think about all the software we're spending money on in our businesses. Right. And we probably only use 10% of the functionality in half of these SaaS applications. You're going to be able to go on to ChatGPT, build a custom version of it that does 80%, and you have no licensing cost and just sit there and run it for your own business going forward. And this, and it's going to be highly disruptive to SaaS because we're not going to need, I mean, I, don't, I, I can, we have at least 50 or 100 SaaS applications we use to do what we do. You know, we use them once a month. This is why am I paying ninety nine dollars a month for this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, to talk about compression and fees and compression and, and costs like that. Yeah. I never even thought about it that way. That's super interesting. Um, on that side of it, I mean, dude, I could talk with you for hours. I mean, I could see this conversation going for. I mean, we we haven't even started talking about wine. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's another whole hour. But before, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be, you know, very, um, you know, cognizant of your time. But I wanna ask one more question. Uh, regarding AI and regarding uh, the book Financial Two that you wrote, um, and I and I, I'm curious on this because I, I've I've experienced this when I was selling technology inside wealth management was there there was there was like a nice to have not a must have because you know in our industry where it's a great industry where we can grow without doing anything right because right. You're investing your AEM model it grows after ten years like your revenue can actually double without you doing anything. And, right. and that's a, not doing not doing anything. You got to keep serving your clients, but you don't have to grow. You don't right. have to invest in growth. 
And so there was no motivation to change. There was no sense of urgency. So when we talk about AI and how the industry is going to be different, there's no urgency to change because they haven't been disrupted. Right. From the credit union side, and maybe you can relate back to wealth management, what is the motivation to change? What is the motivation to adopt AI uh, if there's no, like, there's nothing that's like, their business isn't at risk if they don't. So why would they? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's going to happen is, their efficiency is going to going to be highly disrupted over time, right? Because the the startup fintech that can do it for a tenth the cost, or the bank down the street that is doing it, right, begins to create this example. So I'll, I'll give you like a, a crazy example. So the CFPB came out with a recommendation that they want overdraft and NSF fees to drop to like three dollars instead of the twenty nine dollars or thirty dollars that most financial institution charges, and you think about it, but it's only going to apply to the $10 billion and larger credit unions and, and banks. Okay, well, if you're the $100 million credit union that's competing with the $10 billion bank already, how do you not lower that fee? Right? Like, I mean, sure, you can keep it there for a short period of time, but ultimately, capitalism fixes that, right? And so I, I think the same thing is true with AI, which is the credit unions that and the banks that, and the financial planners that jump on it early will have a long-term sustained competitive advantage that lowers costs, makes them more efficient, allows you to serve another 20% more clients without, you know, having to have a quant on staff or having to, you know, kind of do some of that more advanced financial analysis. And that starts to allow you to spend more quality time with, with your customers. And that builds a competitive advantage, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's the, you know, that's the thing. And I, I, I think until you get some of those entrants in that starts taking business away, yeah. it's the a, motivation it's a won't be there. It's the threat, but it's not the, it's it's a threat that's not going to motivate people. It's the actual of like losing, yeah. losing, you know, on the, you're talking about the income statement, right? Income yeah. statement starts getting impacted. Then it's like, all right, we got to make well, it, but it's too late at that point. Well, you, mean, you look at, you know, I mean, we used to pay a fee to trade a stock, right? Yeah. Like 20 years ago, right? And how quickly did it go from fees to no fees? That was actually 20 years, right? It was not a fast, you know, pace. I was even talking to my dad the other day. He still has a financial planner that goes in and makes stock recommendations on a regular, and my brother-in-law and I are like, what are you doing? Like, who still does this, right? <laughs> How does this guy still have a job, right? Like, uh, and, and so, you know, it still exists out there in some level, you know, of, of insanity. And so I think that the other way to look at it is if you're on the front end of that, well, imagine as a financial planner, you can put in some of these tools and you get the benefit for 20 years before it becomes market condition, right? So you're making an extra 20 to 30% for 20 straight years. Even if it's declining, you're still coming out way ahead, right? Like so, yeah. I, that's how I kind of try to look at it. Is okay, maybe I don't accurately predict, or maybe this market goes away, or whatever it is. But if I can ride the front end of that and get to enjoy it for an extra seven, five, seven, ten years, fantastic, right? Like I win, right? That that's yeah. good enough. It's uh, so true. Such a great perspective, Kirk. I mean, as I said, dude, we could talk forever. I need to have you back on. I'd love sure. to dive more into AI and. As it continues to evolve, find ways to to figure it out together. Um, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna be respectful of time and not selfish on it. Sure. Uh, before I let you go, though, I've got to ask you the two questions I ask everybody. The first one is I'm, I love learning through. I have just a, a thirst for learning, curiosity. I love learning through reading books, and I always like to learn from people that are smarter than me, like yourself. So, what's uh, what's one book out there that you think everybody should read if they haven't, or reread if they already have? Sure. Uh, I think the the Robert Caldini's uh, Influence is probably one of the best books, just general marketing, how people think kind of books I've ever read. Uh, yeah. There. So I, that, that's the multiple. We've had that sent uh, multiple times. I yeah. think it's, such a, it's a core book that should be on everybody's bookshelf. Um, and then the final piece, you know, we talked about a ton here. This was a super fun conversation, yeah. but I always like to give someone actual, actual, something actual they can go and do. Uh, from this conversation, or maybe it's tangential from something we talked about. What, but what's one actual piece of advice you have for the listeners that they can implement today or tomorrow uh, to better themselves or their firm or their clients or whatever it may be? Yeah, I, I think right now I would just encourage you to go get lost for several hours in ChatGPT, trying to think of things you're doing, to try to figure out how to make them better, faster, cheaper in that, and just be curious, you know, and, and when you hit that roll of frustration where it gives you a stupid answer, you don't like what it what it is, 
keep working on it. Tell it, challenge it to give you a better way to do it, right? Like, you know, just keep, you know, pounding your head against that wall because it's usually that third or fourth iteration where suddenly, you know, you come out with something great that that's life changing in some way. Yeah. I love that. Kirk Drake, you're the man, dude. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. When you when you see that you have a podcast guest on that uh, talks about credit unions, you kind of cringe for a second uh, <laughs> because of the industry that it is. But this was anything but cringeworthy, and uh, I learned a lot. Can't wait to keep our conversation going and, and hopefully build a relationship. Uh, and I know that there's others that are out there that are going to want to continue to follow you and learn from you. And so uh, what's the best way for them to, to stay in touch and continue to follow you? Yeah, definitely LinkedIn, just Kirk Drake at, uh, on there and and uh, and you'll find me pretty easily. And that I post regularly uh, and, and always kind of getting messages out, both personal growth, entrepreneurial, credit union, and occasional wine stuff. Uh, uh, so that's kind of where I focus. Love it. Kirk Drake, thanks so much for what you're doing for the industry, for this conversation, and for uh, taking time out to spend it with us here on Bridging the Gaps. So stay well, be well, and we'll talk soon, my friend. Sounds good. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.